Your Excellencies, dear friends, colleagues and family. It is an honor and a great pleasure to wish you welcome to this event. The presence of each and every one of you is highly appreciated, as always, when we want to share experiences and joyful vibes with good persons that are of great importance to us. This year, we have been celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Contiki expedition by a variety of events. We have now come to the final. Today, we will present a book about my grandfather, Tour Heyerdahl, about his work and archive. And we are so lucky to have the opportunity to watch a remarkable film at Odeon Cinema afterwards. A special welcome to Kingston Twinder and Lucy Kingett, I hope I got the names, names right, from Atelier Editions in Los Angeles, and Stian Indrevol, the director and filmmaker. Please, would you stand up? <laughs> So, Raidar, their colleague, our museum's um, curator, he will introduce you to the program, and I really wish you a pleasant afternoon. We had invited uh, a professor from the University of Oslo to, to give some perspective on, uh, on the legacy of Tor Herald. Unfortunately, she has, as several others have today, come down with a cold and she couldn't be here. So I'm happy to step in, even though it's a bit, a bit stressful. <laughs> <laughs> and I might give you a, a less objective uh, view of a hair loss legacy than other people, but at least I have been studying the man and his work for almost 30 years. In 1998, Vege, the biggest newspaper in Norway, wanted to have a competition. They wanted people to choose who is the finest Norwegian of the 20th century. They had a big committee, they chose a bunch of candidates, and people voted. You might think that Fritz of Nansen won. I mean, he was a pioneering scientist, he was an adventurer, the first man to ski across Greenland. He did some work for the pan-European movement after World War I, and he helped war refugees. But no, they didn't choose him. Perhaps Roald Amundsen, the first man on the South Pole? No. Of course, it was Herdal. And Amundsen and Nansen didn't even make the short three list. <laughs> uh, that's probably because this is a historic moment. Anyway, the main political editor of the newspaper was quite irked by this, and he wrote a comment in the newspaper telling people that if you had made your choice by logic and knowledge and not by emotions, you have, would have chosen either King Haakon VII, who stood up to the German invasion of uh, Norway in 1940, or perhaps even uh, the Prime Minister Einar Gerhardsen, who was rebuilding the country after World War II. And the newspaper even hired some pollsters to find out why this man made the top of the list. It turned out that Heyerdahl was just as popular in the big cities in Oslo and Bergen and Trondheim as he was in the small coastal towns or even in the isolated farmsteads up in the 
country or in the Arctic part of Norway. He was also equally popular amongst men as with women. Uh, his um, work, anyway. <laughs> uh, he was also equally liked by people all political persuasions. It was only one group he, he failed to garner the majority of support, and that was in very young people who voted online. In that competition, he only ranked number seven. And that kind of, I, I believe, reflects uh, Tor Heyerdahl's uh, attitude and, and even his uh, oldest son's attitudes towards computers. <laughs> they hate them. <laughs> well, since 1965, five biographies and three TV series have been made about Heyerdahl's life and work. So why is this man's accomplishment still interesting 108 years after his birth and 20 years after he passed away? My short and simple answer is that his storytelling affected people. And it still touches people, giving them reasons to choose a different profession or to go on an adventure. And this happens throughout the world. Present today, and we're very proud of that, is ambassadors from Czechia, from Cuba, from uh, Turkey, from Peru, and from Spain representing most, if not all, the, the, the um, continents of the world. And this is a, a testament to the enormous reach of this single life. And Tor Herdal was truly a citizen of the world. And he phrased his, his work as, I'm looking for nothing less than our common ex origin. So maybe we should explore a little bit and perhaps try to give an explanation for these commoners' fascination with Thor Heyerdahl's life and work. Their interest in contrast to the often stark, critical attitude given to him by academic elite and the occasional journalists. Of course, the Kontiki expedition is the event that made Heyerdahl famous. And it's the most important event that determined his life. And this expedition kind of gives you four fundamental principles that guided his work or his success. And one, and the most important, was the curiosity in finding answers to questions or mysteries, <coughs> primarily of a historical nature. Also, the fact that he believed in his own convictions when he examined these questions or mysteries, and his willingness to put his life on the line for what he believed in. But that principle didn't go beyond risking his life unless there was a serious research question that had to be answered. And fourth, I will say he had a willingness or, or a cunning ability to explain these historical questions or mysteries to other people. And that was part of his, his uh, life mission. As you can see, here's a couple of expeditions that in sailing, I mean, w w what they accomplished through sailing is with rival the Contiki. In 1867, uh, Five or six young men from America built a raft on, uh, with rubber platoons and sailed from America to England. And the size of the raft and the hut is about the same size as the Contiki. And it garnered a lot of um, news at the time, but it was made purely because it was exciting. And they just wanted to see if they could make it. On the other hand, 1893, there was a um, wool fair in, I think, Chicago, at least in America. And uh, some Norwegian people wanted to go there in a Viking ship 
to tell the Americans and the world that the Vikings had discovered America. Um, they built a, a sort of a replica of the, one of the Viking ships and sailed. And it was an adventurous journey. The, the, the ship was blown by the winds and by the waves 360 degrees around. At least that's what they say in the book. I, I wasn't there, so I can't, <laughs> I can't vouch for that. In contrast, the reason why Heyerdahl did the Kantiki was because researchers, academics, claimed that the boat or the raft wouldn't float long enough for the Peruvians to sail to the Polynesian islands. And he was meticulous in following the indigenous knowledge that had been recorded, both through historical books, but also through uh, people uh, investigating these rafts that were still used on the South American coast in the 40s. And he also said that the only reason we actually made it was that we followed the way of building and constructing a sailing raft to a letter. And Heyerdahl kind of inspired a lot of other people to do experiments. Today we call it maritime experimental archaeology. Second point I want to stress is his ability to talk to people. This is uh, an old picture from the 50s when this museum opened. Uh, they didn't have a, a lot of equipment, so they just put the um, books on the ground. <laughs> and then they went on top of the building photographing it. <laughs> but they were proud that the book had been translated into so many languages. And today it has been translated into 84 languages. Uh, and this is a testimony that the story reached all kinds of people and were interested, uh, were, were well received all over the world. Um, it sold as much in, well, at, at the time, the, 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 during the Cold War, as much in capitalistic America as in uh, the communist Soviet Union. 200,000 in the first editions in each place. And this was a conscious choice by Heyerdahl. I mean, he, he liked to do it, he had to do it, and he also claimed a year before the Contiki expedition that next year I will be on the top of the bestseller, New York Times bestseller list. It took four. In 1950, he, he came on the list and stayed for 50, but another important aspect is, I mean, Contiki is about where did the Polynesians come from? How did they sail and discover all these islands? And by garnering all this news coverage and um, stating a new theory, Heyerdahl got people interested. This is on the left, it's a young kid from America in the 60s. On the right, this is, I think it's from the 80s actually, the Club Contiki in uh, Siberia. And when you go through the archive, you see letters to the editors for newspapers from all kinds of people. I mean, academics, of course, historians, ethnologists, linguists. But you also see letters from engineers, from doctors, from nurses, from school teachers. And practical-minded people, they all discussed where did the Polynesian came from. And that was Heyerdahl's ability to get people interested in something that most people wouldn't think too much about. In stark contrast to, to, to at least how he had been covered by the media in modern times. Um, but instead, instead of dwelling on that, I would just show you some photos from the Contiki Museum. Top left, it's the original Contiki house. Opened the uh, 15th of May, 1950. Um, Harold paid for that museum. He, he wrote a text for the museum, 
and everybody thought it would be a temporary museum that would close down after three or four years. But after three years, it was the most popular museum in Norway. So they built a new building in 1956, and you are here in um, 2022. <laughs> and now at least 17, maybe 18 million people have come and visited and learned about Heyerdahl's expeditions. But there's another legacy of Heyerdahl that I should mention. When you read all his earliest letters and theories, it's about reaching back to nature. He wanted to live in harmony with nature some kind, somehow. He also warned us against destroying our environment, especially the ocean, which he was very passionate about. He called it the world ocean, he said. There were, is in the ocean, life developed. And if we damage the ocean, life will end. And when he sailed in the raw across the Atlantic, they also discovered that there was a lot of oil pollution. Researchers knew about it, but maybe politicians weren't quite aware of it. And through Heydal's letter to the United Nations Secretary General, Utant at the time, they got more focus on this question. And, and today, this pollution, this kind of pollution, is solved. And Heydal was part of the first environmental conference in um, Stockholm in 72 as a delegate from, the, from Norway. Another very deep point in Heyerdahl is that all people are created equal. I mean, today most people believe that. Uh, most people are putting that as a fundamental fact. But for Heyerdahl, it's not so much about the moral in it, because he, he, he always believed this but it's about the fact that if we are the same, we can experience pe uh, people's life. Uh, it, it's, if, they are, if we are the same people in Norway as in the Pacific Ocean, we will have the same needs and um, thoughts if we were born in the Roman times. And I think that's a connection back to his interest in experimental archaeology. He wanted to do practically what ancient man had done in order to try and understand better how ancient man understood the world or thought about the world. Left uh, is from... Um, village in uh, southern Iraq, 1977. This is a one world conference. Heyerdahl had a political side. He, he rarely showed it, but personally, he believed that the United Nations should be kind of a world government. Uh, because if we are all together, we should be that in practice as well as in theory. So this was his goal, his work, and this was his life. Talking to people, experience new culture, finding new mysteries, historical mysteries that he could solve or at least attempt to solve in order to find what binds us together. Well, thank you. Yes. Two years ago, the museum were approached by Kingston Trinder, a cheerful Kiwi, a white bearded male who wanted to publish a book about Thor Heyerdahl and his archive. The publishing house, which he helped co found it, is the Los Angeles based Atelier Edition. They specialize in hunting down odd, exciting scientific archives 
and present the story about them in beautiful designed books, as you can see here. Kingston Trinder is a nonfiction author and a publisher and a recipient of several literary awards, creative fellowship and writer's residences, and also holds a degree in cultural anthropology. Well, it's from your website, man. <laughs> uh, and he has uh, written or contributed to 15 books. Uh, for two years, we had a very fruitful uh, collaboration and uh, a lot of fun during Zoom meetings. And I'm really happy and really proud to welcome him to Norway to the Contiki Museum. And he will now give us a few insights in his own writing process. Welcome. Very sorry that you need to. All you tall Norwegians. You bring it down slightly. Wow, this is all very exciting, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. All these tall Norwegians, I should have worn heels. <laughs> oh. uh, let's get on with it then. Uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for coming. I mean, it's an absolute honour, really. Uh, my editor, Lucy, is here with us as well. And it's extraordinary, an absolute honour. So, so thank you very much for coming. And, uh, yeah, well, let's get into it. I am so sure that the Indians crossed the Pacific on their raft that I'm willing to build a raft of the same kind myself and cross the sea just to prove that it's possible. I remember reading Tor Heyerdahl's truly audacious, defiant, adventuresome words nearly 20 years ago in the fateful summer of 2003 while an anthropology undergraduate in New Zealand. I was then 19 years old and deeply enamored with a farmer's daughter. Rather surprisingly, he wasn't enamored with me. Uh, and I was an arrogant, impressionable, and, and inquisitive as only, as, as only a first-year anthropology student could possibly be. Really tiresome, I imagine. Uh, in any case, after the first year spent immersed with an near impenetrable fol foliage of various anthropological theories, I'm talking, you know, Franz Boas, Milanowski, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, Clifford Goetz, you name it, Mass or Mass, ad infinitum. I remember being immediately drawn to Heidel's iconoclastic defiance and his truly inspiring practical application of what often seemed to me abstract theory, empirically and superimposed. I thought, here's a man who's actually going out and doing it. He's, he's going out and doing anthropology. And, uh, you know, there was often this sort of notion that we'd go and find charming cultural informants who would give forth their culture to us, us bearded white men. And uh, I thought it was so, so much more inspiring that here was someone going out and actually doing it. Um, so here, however, was an authentic man of action, a Norwegian, no less. A man so convinced by his own unorthodox theory of Polynesian migration that he'd constructed a balsa wood raft to ancient Peruvian design. Raider didn't give me a, a staple. Uh, one moment. Constructed to ancient Peruvian design and sailed westward across the vast Pacific Ocean. To my deeply impressionable mind, this chaotic Heyerdahl, this character, sorry, this chaotic Heyerdahl character was either a madman or a true visionary or both. In any case, I had to learn more. And that summer, I feverishly read all of Heyerdahl's books, beginning, of course, with the Kentucky, with the Kentucky. I found in Peru surprising traces in culture, mythology, and language, he declared within Contiki, which compelled me to identify the origin of the Polynesian tribal god Tiki. And he became thereafter, convinced thereafter that the white chief god son Tiki, whom the, the Incas declared their forefathers, had banished from Peru onto the Pacific, uh, uh, onto the Pacific, was identical to the white chief god Tiki, son of the sun, whom the inhabitants of all the eastern Pacific islands hailed as the original founder of their race, and that Polynesia was first settled by peoples voyaging westward from South America, not from the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia, as conventional theories propounded. 
So rather disgracefully, I, a Pākehā, a pale-faced New Zealander, had never really truly considered Polynesia's origins, or even the origins of the New Zealand Māori themselves. And here I am studying anthropology. As school children, we were simply informed, and somewhat controversially now, that the present-day Māori had simply arrived by a vast waka, uh, wooden um, canoes, enormous wooden canoes, and that somehow, this also wasn't clear, that either annihilated, cannibalised, or simply superse superseded the nation's original Maori inhabitants, New Zealand's Maori inhabitants. The Maori and the Maori's origins, however, were never identified, they were always identified simply as Polynesian, and I'd certainly never heard of any Kotiki. Heidel's captivating Kotiki voyage encompassed for my young self an equally captivating theory of Polynesian origin, one that would time, with time gradually transformed my conception both of New Zealand's Polynesian cultural heritage and my own identity as a European New Zealander, a, a pale face. My migration theory was not necessarily proved by the successful outcome of the Kontiki expedition, Hyardale acknowledged. However, he nevertheless believed uh, his remarkable expedition proved that the Pacific Islands are located well inside the range of prehistoric craft in Peru. Primitive people are capable of undertaking voyages over the, over the ocean, aided, he believed, by the trade winds and the westward oscillating equatorial currents. A, rest, a westward orientation never changed in all the history of mankind. Blissfully unaware then of just how controversial, in some quarters anyhow, Heyerdahl's unorthodox Polynesian theory was, and unaware then too of diffusionist versus isolationist paradigms, accusations of unintentional or otherwise ethnocentrism, cultural relativism and appropriation, I myself became quite convinced then by his theory. Whether Heyerdahl was correct or not, he had certainly offered a compelling argument. He'd gone to extraordinary lengths to substantiate this theory. And he expressed plenty of New Zealand approved humility in acknowledging even after completing such a voyage, he may in fact have been entirely wrong. My infatuation with this enigmatic explorer was complete. In the middle of my second year of university, I spent several transformative weeks sailing down the east coast of Australia, from Cairns all the way to north of Sydney, and gazing towards the unchanging horizon where radiant blue seawater and heaven completely entwined beneath the ceaseless sunshine, or heavenward at the... And if these, uh, uh, and if these two civilizations separated by apparently unimaginable distance, were somehow entwined, were perhaps other nations entwined in some, some way. By then I'd read most of Heyerdahl's books, uh, in, including Fatu Hiva, and the farmer's daughter and I were no longer together. Perhaps my half-serious suggestion that she and I undertake a similar expedition, uh, a similar experiment, had somehow contributed to our demise. In any case, I remember being entranced by Heyerdahl's account of his very first practical experiment, uh, an attempted return to a Pacific island, unscathed by modern civilization, an island where he dreamed man and woman could return to the life abandoned by our ancestors. I'd also now read Aku Aku and wondered alongside other readers whether the enigmatic monumental Moai were, Moai were in fact vestiges of an antecedent South American civilization, as Heyerdahl had also convincingly claimed, and devoured as well the Ra expeditions and Tigris expedition. Marveling again at his courage and his practical experiments, to my mind, he was the very embodiment of participant observation. His romantic archaeological forays, his celebration of multiculturalism, his synthesis of innumerable disciplines, which is troubling to some and exhilarating to many, including me, and his imaginative diffusionist hypothesizing. If only the sea, rumbling sea could speak, he wrote, within Ra. For the sea would tell, he believed, of unrecorded voyages of antiquity that would match any of those recorded in the medieval age. The people of Egypt and Mesopotamia had bred sailors as able as their architects. Uh, architects. And on distant... Oh my goodness, this is an absolute nightmare. Uh, on distant... Excuse me. Terribly unorganised. And on distant Mediterranean islands that formed stepping stones to the north and to the west, 
that cause seaborne civilizations to blossom with different languages and different scripts. Eventually graduating from university with my anthropology degree, uh, rather surprising, I wasn't immediately employed. Uh, I immediately headed abroad. I went to England and then the continent and further afield. And I would not return to New Zealand for several years. Uh, and nor would my thoughts return to, to Heyerdahl's unorthodox theories and remarkable expeditions. Until spring of 2021, the world much changed by a devastating global pandemic. And perhaps more devastating, the idea that I was about to become a father that winter, a first-time father. A, a terrifying voyage into the vast unknown. Still very terrifying ten months later. Um, revisiting Heyerdahl's remarkable urban life's narrative almost 20 years later, I would discover rather unsurprisingly he possessed a character endowed with greater complexity than I'd ever anticipated. For how to express such contagious idealism and humanitarianism with it as books, papers, and seminars, yet was frequently disillusioned by humankind, by, sorry, by humankind's devastation of our natural environment, our asymmetrical relationships between the developing and developed world, and our apparent disregard and our pursuit of an ever industrialized Anthropocene for the sustainable future of Mother Earth. Nevertheless, however, his contagious enthusiasm and idealism would prevail, drawing readers and audiences away from passive resignation towards actionable, sustainable future creation. The Heidel's substantiation of unorthodox migration theories, I can't even speak, I need a glass of water, excuse me. Substantiating unorthodox migration theories that is the interconnection of apparently separate continents, cultures, and civilizations through pa practical experiments, sailing ancient watercraft, across, ancient watercraft across vast oceans, constitutes much of Heyerdahl's celebrated earth and thought. However, during the course of the Tigris and uh, Ra and Tigris expeditions, we encounter the, his nascent environmentalism and expanding political consciousness. Macrocosmic, macrocosmic considerations which would increasingly characterize many of his thoughts and endeavors. Confronted by the ocean's degradation, he would declare that we must never forget that we are part of a symbiosis of biological species, ranging from the oxygen-producing plankton of the sea and forests of the land to the food-producing soil and water. Humanity's survival, he believed, necessitated the, the protection of nature, a complex, a, a complex ecosystem sustaining an equilibrium, an equilibrium between the multitude of biological species. These are all quotes, nice quotes too. Um, witnessing war, witnessing warfare in the Middle East, Heyerdahl implored the United Nations to immediately affect global peace initiatives, including disarmament, national border eradication, and globalization, symbi symbiotic globalization. Uh, characterizing as transatlantic voyages, completed with sailors drawn from throughout the world, uh, as illustrative microcosms of harmonious multiculturalism, he believed with characteristic humility that our modest human experiment, I mean, the man's just sailing across the, you know, the Atlantic on a reed, on a reed boat, modest, modest endeavor. Uh, our modest experiment should encourage the faith of all of those who believe in bringing men of all nations together. United, he wrote, humanity could vanquish mutual problems and survive in a small world where we all have equal rights to coexist and more to gain from mutual aid than from hostility and destruction. Peaceful coexistence, he sincerely believed, demanded infinitely more strength and courage than violent antagonism. We're almost there. Sustaining humankind's existence on Mother Earth, he believed, necessitated harmonious interrelations with all of our species and now with our natural environments, our lands, our oceans, and our shared atmosphere. Achieving that equilibrium between individuals, nations, and Mother Earth, he believed, active participation by a new enlightened generation of humanitarians and environmentalists, each endowed with a new macrocosmic consciousness. Casting aside our ethnic faith and race-centered distinctions in favor of sincere biophilia, love of life in the living world, the affinity 
we, 8 billion human beings, have for all other life forms remained essential to preserving life, and our, life on earth and ourselves. Whether we are Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, Muslims or Darwinists, we all agree that man was created by an ecosystem, he declared. Uh, believing then that our industrialization and our so-called civilization was essentially destroying our planet. Our planet is designed not for man alone. Our extended family, which grew up on this planet before us, comprises, comprises all species, planted as tiny seeds to grow, to grow up, enjoy a limited lifetime on Earth, and multiply to survive eternally as a species. Anticipating the need for a more sustainable Anthropocene, one within which all species symbiotically coexist, Heyerdahl's environmentalism and practical humanitarianism, his remarkable voyages and unorthodox theories remain equally salient today in 2022, certain to inspire future generations of enamored readers and revisiting perhaps by another once a much older, less idealistic uh, anthropologist from New Zealand, would-be anthropologist from New Zealand. Um, Heyerdahl's theory, legacy, to my mind, remains that of a biophilic life, uh, sorry, his, his, theory, his, his legacy to me remains one of an, of an exemplary bi biophilic life, an actualized declaration for pursuing visions, however unorthodox, nurturing world-evolving idealism, and despite frequent disillusionment, uh, sustaining un an unwavering belief in the infinite humanity and goodness of human humankind, come what may. Our world may have trans transformed significantly during the course of Heyerdahl's lifetime. He passed away in 2002. However, the impassioned words he wrote in a letter to Liv Torp in 1944 regarding their Fatuhiva expedition remains just as transformational today as when they were first authored nearly 80 years ago. And these very lovely words from, from Heyerdahl, I'll, I'll, I'll end my, my little talk with. A lovely, lovely bit of writing he wrote to his then wife. The essence today is the same today as in the days of the pharaohs. It is the same for someone from the Congo as it is for someone from Norway, in Alaska as in the Sahara. And it is symbolized by nature itself, by the magic rays of the sun, the mystery of the moonlight, the splendor of the flowers, the solid power of the mountains, the purity of the spring water, the abundant diversity of wildlife, and the love and charm of the human couple. It is a bottomless source from which we can fetch, and we allow to fetch as much as we want. Not only do we have permission to use this source, we have a moral duty to do so. We have learned that it is more than the art of physical nature that creates happiness and harmony. We have learned that a paradise is not found on this earth, but that, but that it can be wonderful and full of possibilities despite this fact. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. <clears throat> in 1955-56, Torreira organized the first archaeological excavations on Rapa Nui, more commonly known as Easter Island. He privately funded a 12-month expedition with five archaeologists and an entire ship's crew. One of the young sailors participating in this expedition was Yuan Kloster. He will Tell us a few personal stories about Thor Herdal as an expedition leader. And at the end, we hope that he and Thor Herdal Jr. will sing one of two songs <laughs> which they learned on Rapa Nui as very young boys. Please welcome Johan Kloster. Dear friends, um, I am one of the few members of the expedition who have survived so far. 
<laughs> and there is one other man, Tor Jr. We we'll hear more about them later. Um, the expedition in 1955-56 was a very complex uh, task. It went to one of the most, some of the most remo remote places in the world, right out in the middle of the largest ocean of the world in the Pacific. Some of the places we went to, it was more than 1,000 nautical miles to the nearest place we could get supply. Uh, it had uh, 21 uh, members in the crew on the, or the participant of the uh, uh, expedition, counting everybody. And um, it was, it lasted for a whole year. And uh, Thor Heyerdahl was a man who played the, paid the bill and made the general plan for the expedition. And I shall not boast about the famous explorer, uh, the famous man, Thor Heyerdahl, or be servile about it, but except for a few incidences, motor trouble, engine trouble with the expedition ship Christian Bialan in the first days of the trip, and uh, uh, accident in Anakena later on, and the expedition, everything worked according to Tour Heidel's plan. Perfectly, we missed nothing, and everything I think was, has to be uh, stated was very su successful. Um, quoting the fact that everything that could have gone wrong, uh, wrong were technical side, the social aspects of so many people working so tightly together with such a complete different background as the participant of the uh, uh, expedition had. Uh, and this is important. Inspiring the population of Israel, which have given a very long-lasting result uh, he, um, while his archaeologist went out to dig in the ground for the history of the island, Tor Heidal went out, and let me say, it was or rather, he went out to dug into the minds of men for the history of the island, to learn about the oral history, to learn about the long traditional and cultural heritage of the island that had very nearly been lost, completely lost. It is said that Tour maybe was the first that ever took an interest to listen to the population. And mind you, the population of this island had been bullied for 100 years in the 1850s taken to slaves as slaves to Peru. Later on, introduced 
diseases which they could not resist. And when we were out there, much of the land had been so low to uh, European in interest for cattle raising. The people of the island, the inhabitants, could hardly walk around wherever they liked without permission. So what did Tour do? He didn't take part in any politics. He had a good uh, cooperation with the governor and it went in harmony, everything. But he went out to talk with people, to learn about the traditions, to learn about how things worked out. And mind you, social, he worked as a social anthropologist. And the social anthropologists have learned the archaeologists that you don't necessarily have to dig up a Viking ship to know what how a ship was built and why it was built the way it was. In Norway, one can go out to the west coast of the Norway, sit down in a shed, boat building shed of a traditional boat builder, talk with him, learn about him, and it's a condition a uh, continuous um, tradition of uh, clinky building, shell construction technique, which is just the same as it has been done thousand years earlier. Torhara used that technique on Israel uh, with spectacular results. <coughs> The people suddenly remembered things that had been forgotten. How do one move a statue? How do one, one raise a statue? And uh, how do one, one even build a statue? How many minutes? Three, Three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I shall finish up. So, um, and this is important because <laughs> Thor Heidel did this in uh, self-interest. It was egocentric, motivated, but the result was the same. And what was the result? The result was that today one really know much more about the history of the island than ever before. And the main thing is that the population of the island have got their pride of history back, of their cultural history. And today, if you go to the island, you can go to the big, fascinating festivals and to watch uh, how the, uh, they have taken pride in their own history today. And so many people here, or not many, but a few, have been there and go there all the time. So uh, you can talk about them and learn from them how you should get there and maybe if you want to travel to the East Rhine. So then I think, Tor, can you come and help me with something? Are we wrestling or? No, 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 no. We have to finish off this uh, sermon. <laughs> so, uh, what should I say? I started off to say everything worked out fine. We didn't miss anything, practically and otherwise. And uh, 
We didn't even miss a Christmas tree. A Christmas tree was taken out of the cooler of the Christian Bialan, brought on to the beach, planted solidly in the sand, and there we celebrated Christmas, not by uh, uh, singing hymns and uh, traditional song, but the local songs like Hot So we haven't sung it for 65 years. <laughs> Thank you.